Hello, everybody. Um, thanks so much for being here. This is um, our first um, our first ever virtual rain garden workshop. Uh, we do ha have them every year, but normally they're in person, which um, I'm definitely going to be missing this year. I, I, I like in person better than virtual, but um, but we're going to make it work. So um, thanks for being here. I did want to let you all know that this is being recorded. Uh, so all of you um, and others can view the classes following the following the workshop. We will be posting um, posting the recordings and um, we are asking that participants all stay muted throughout the class, um, but we encourage you to post questions in the chat and we'll do the best um, to answer those questions at the end of the class. All right, let me get situated here. Um, Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I am using two screens, so if I'm not looking at you, I'm not ignoring you, I'm looking at my other screen, so um, just kind of bear with me. Um, let's see here. Okay. Again, welcome uh, to those of us who just joined. Um, this is our virtual rain garden workshop series. You're in the right spot if you're here. Uh, and this is our first of three classes. We have over 60 people who are registered um, for the class. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, and hopefully everything is working for all of you. Um, again, if there's any, um, you should all be muted at this point, but if there are any issues, you can, um, you can um, put them in the chat and hopefully um, Casey is kind of taking a look at that and monitoring that for us, Casey Hansen, um, and she'll uh, try to address, address whatever's in there, um, any concerns. And then again, um, if you have any questions, we're holding all questions until the end of, um, of the class. Um, but if you have any questions as we go through presentations, please feel free to um, post those in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them at the end of, of the class. So. Um, before we start, I just wanted to welcome you all and let you know that, you know, before we even start the class, um, I consider you all water heroes, um, just simply because you're here, you're taking time out of your busy schedule on a, um, on a Tuesday evening uh, to learn about rain gardens. So um, super excited that you are here and thanks for being here. Um, before we start, uh, I just, we, um, our, our group that kind of planned this planned this workshop really wanted to dedicate this workshop um, to one of our friends and colleagues, um, Roger Bannerman. Um, he is really uh, the true water superhero, which you'll you'll hear about him in a second, and you'll see why. Um, so he we wanted to dedicate this uh, this workshop to Roger because he passed away last year, and again was was the true water superhero. For those of you that don't know him. Roger worked for the DNR for the past 40 years and was instrumental in developing uh, Wisconsin Stormwater Management Program. Anyone who works in the world of stormwater in Wisconsin has probably either interacted with Roger directly or at a minimum watched his presentations or read a publication that he's authored. Uh, in fact, he was the primary author of the um, original Wisconsin Rain Garden Manual, which is what we're using for this class. And um, most of you were mailed a copy. Um, I personally really got to know Roger uh, about five years ago when, while working on a leaf study here in Madison. He is an incredibly smart, or was an incredibly smart man, um, but had this ability to explain very complex issues in a way that anyone could understand them. He was so passionate and dedicated to his work that you couldn't help but want to listen to him and take action. Granted, you always had to carve out at least a half hour if you wanted to ask Roger a question but you really didn't mind because he's just one of those people who is such a joy to, uh, to talk to. He was a huge supporter of rain gardens and had several in his yard. So I know he's looking down on us today with a big smile on his face, um, you know, being part of this big rain garden workshop with over 60 people, he would love this. This is just exactly who he was. Um, those are just a few pictures of Roger um, on, on the screen right now. Hopefully, are you, can you see my screen? I'm, I hope so. <laughs> okay, I, I'm guessing somebody would have told me at this point. This is what happened in my last presentation earlier this week. Um, but these are some pictures of Roger, um, really just doing his thing. Um, <laughs> he loved to talk to people, um, and again was so passionate about what he did, and just you know wanting to teach people about um, the work he did. 
So you can see, you know, this, this is just a perfect Roger. Um, this is his rain garden um, on the left side right there. I'm sure he was just, you know, talking about it and, and to this person that's learning. And then um, again, I think this one was in his backyard, uh, the picture on the bottom. And um, also he, he was a, um, a member of the Friends um, of Lake Wingra. And again, just teaching and learning, or learning and, you know, teaching um, were, his, were his strengths and, um, and his passion. So you can see him here in this picture um, in a booth. Um, I'm sure ready to teach people about about water and storm water and and water quality and how to protect it. So we're just really excited um, to be able to dedicate this to Roger. Okay, so now I'd like to present our our introduce our presenters for today. Um, we'll start off with Teresa. She's helped. She, you already heard her name. She's been helping me here just with all the logistical stuff here. So Teresa is a stormwater engineer in the county's water resource engineering division, where she reviews erosion control and stormwater plans for new development and designs, stormwater treatment practices for our county parks, and she helped start the county's volunteer native plant grower program. She also grows over 100 species of native plants herself. So. You can see Teresa's picture right here, and then on the, in the corner of everybody's picture, we also have a picture of a native plant. Um, we asked the, all the presenters to, to give us a native plant that um, is either their favorite native plant or a native plant that, um, that might kind of be like them. <laughs> so Teresa, if Teresa was a native plant, she would be Blue Lobelia. Like Teresa, blue lobelia is somewhat short in stature with a height of around two to three feet. It's adaptable, adaptable as it is happy in wetter or drier conditions. It's not as showy as other flowers, but is well liked by numerous pollinators. It will occasionally surprise you as it sometimes produces seedlings that have white instead of blue flowers. So that's Teresa and you'll be hearing from her a little, a little later um, in, the, in the class today. Next up, we have Emily. Um, Emily Jorgensen works for the City of Madison Engineering Department on stormwater land, including greenways, ponds, and rain gardens. She loves working to promote native vegetation in these systems. Her favorite part of her job is seeing more natives established on sites that her and Maddie, and you'll, you'll um, meet Maddie later in one of the next classes, um, to one of the sites that her and Maddie have been working on at at for years. If Emily were a native plant, she would be great St. John's wort. It gets tall, up to six feet. It likes to get its feet wet or roots. Um, it produces bright yellow flowers in July and ripe seeds pour like sand out of the seed capsule, which is super satisfying to her. Next up, um, we have Phil. So Phil will be joining us. Um, he is gonna be talking about the green infrastructure um, reimbursement for the city of Madison that's following our presentation today at 730 for those of you that live in the um, in the green infrastructure pilot area. And Phil is a water resources engineer for the city of Madison and has focused on improving the quality of stormwater leaving the city during his time there. He has a bachelor's degree in agricultural engineering from the University of Illinois and a master's in civil engineering from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He has interests in green infrastructure and creating spaces that can both treat stormwater and provide amenities to the community. His neighbors will often find him checking on his rain garden during intense rainstorms. He is unsure why they're outside in the rain without a rain garden to check on. If Phil were a plant, he would be ironweed. When he thought of plants that represent him, they needed to be tall, adaptable, and be a good cook. Ironweed hits the mark as it provides late season nectar for pollinators, is tall, and can grow in a variety of soil. It's also considered tough, which is a nice bonus. And there's his super cute little daughter, Emma. So he, he wins for the, for the cutest picture, definitely. I love how she's just kind of popping out the back of there. Um, and then this is me. Um, I kind of flipped it a little bit because I wanted I wanted the native um, to be kind of the shining star as cardinal flower usually is. Um, so uh, just a little background on my on me. Uh, I'm a stormwater education coordinator for Dane County 
and the Madison Area Municipal Stormwater Partnership. I've been with the county for the past five years and have worked in the world of environmental education um, at DNR and Extension uh, prior to coming to Dane County, uh, specifically water related education for the past 15 years. My favorite native plant, which also happens to be a good rain garden plant, is cardinal flower. I can't say it's necessarily one that I share a lot in common with, though, as I'm not tall, I don't think of myself as really showy, and I don't like to be the center of attention. The reason I love it, though, is because it's such a superstar. It's hard not to stop and look at it. I have it in my rain garden in my front yard, and it's so neat to see people stop and look at it and smile. Plus, I think hummingbirds are the coolest thing ever. And there's always bound to be hummingbirds there um, when the cardinal flower is in full bloom in late summer. Not being a native plant expert, it was kind of the first native to capture my attention and lure me into one to learn more. So if you look, I have that little yellow, um, that little yellow arrow. There's a little hummingbird, which is really hard to see, but right at the top there. And it's, it's so fun to watch the hummingbirds um, come up to the cardinal flower. I just, it just absolutely makes my day. So. Anyways, just a little bit about, um, about all our presenters today. So why are we having this whole workshop on rain gardens anyways? People didn't actively build rain gardens back hundreds of years ago. So what's changed? Well, our landscapes have changed over the years. It seems like everywhere you go, new buildings, parking lots, homes are popping up. So this is just a graphic of um, of Manhattan um, <laughs> in New York, uh, what it may have looked like hundreds of years ago, you know, without any buildings, any concretes, any parking lots, um, just in its natural state. And then obviously on the bottom there is, um, is what it looks like now, um, what we're used to. And then I also wanted to show something that's a little bit closer to home. So um, this is using our our DCI maps, and I will actually um, demo this for you later, um, but it's a, a tool we have um, with aerial photography. Um, and this is an aerial photograph of, uh, the neighborhood, um, of the neighborhood I live in on the west side of Madison. So it, it borders Middleton. And um, it's just two, um, two aerial photographs, one from 1987. So our neighborhood, I live kind of down here, um, our neighborhood um, was first established in the early 80s. Um, so this is from 1987, and this is from um, 2020. And you can just see um, how things changed. I mean, you have the parcels here. Um, there, there's layers that overlay these maps, um, but just how much things has, have changed over the years. So um, specifically what I wanted to point out is um, just, these are some ponds that are in our neighborhood. For those of you that are familiar with the west side of Madison, this is Stricker's Pond, and this is um, Tiedemann's Pond in Middleton. And you can see kind of how small these ponds were um, back you know, when this area was just starting to get developed in the early 80s. Well, this is late 80s, but um, it was getting, starting to get developed in the early 80s. And then how much it's changed and how large um, these ponds have become um, today, you know, in 2020. And, you know, as we move from a more natural landscape um, with lots of green space and trees to a more urbanized landscape, um, we obviously change the way that rain moves and where it goes. And you can see how much more stormwater is getting into these ponds um, than it did, you know, back 30 years ago. So in natural systems, um, much of the rain that falls eventually soaks into the earth and into our soils. It recharges our groundwater, which is our drinking water source. Um, you know I'm going to move this over here for a second. Sorry. It's just kind of throwing me off to have you guys on my other screen and not in front of me. Um, so um, again, that water that soaks in the ground uh, recharges our groundwater and that's where we get our drinking water here in south, um, south central Wisconsin. And most of Wisconsin gets their drinking water unless you're on um, kind of the Lake Michigan or Lake Superior coast um, from, from groundwater. It also uh, slows, you know, back down through the soil and into our, um, into our lakes, rivers, and streams. And as it's moving down through the soil, it filters out pollutants on the way. So 
as we've started to develop our natural areas, we've gone from kind of the top left where, again, you know, completely natural area, there's no development, um, you know, to kind of we've moved in this direction. Um, so, you know, if there's natural, if it's completely natural um, and it hasn't been um, developed at all, um, most of the runoff, you know, almost 80 to 100 percent of, not runoff, 80 to 100 percent of the rainwater actually infiltrates and soaks into the ground. There's very little runoff. Um, as you start to develop, you can you kind of see the progression here as you get into more of a, a very urbanized area. Now you're seeing a lot of runoff um, with very little of that water actually infiltrating. The majority of it is running off the landscape um, with little actually soaking into the ground. So where does all that storm water go? Um, in areas like Madison and, and um, South Central Wisconsin, that, well, all the water ends up running off if it doesn't if it doesn't actually infiltrate or soak into the ground it runs off our roofs off of our um, lot of even our lawns and our driveways and our streets uh, and it carries you know anything that it comes uh, anything along the way with it and once it leaves our you know our hardscapes um, it ends up in a storm drain if you're especially if you're if you're in you know an urban setting um, storm drains are all over you don't notice them you're not supposed to notice them they're supposed to carry it you know carry the storm water away and kind of the pollutants away um, unfortunately the storm water most of the storm water that ends up in our storm drains um, it does not get treated it ends up you know just washing into our lakes rivers and streams So that's kind of the problem is that we just have a little too much of that storm water, especially in the urban environment where you don't have a lot of um, a lot of, you know, green areas or natural areas where you have a lot of hardscapes or impervious surfaces, we like to call them. And I, I just like to kind of showcase this little house here. Um, this is, you know, not a huge house. It's maybe 1800 square feet maybe your average size house in Dane County area. Um, and this is just the roof um, is 1800 square feet. And if it would rain one inch, that would produce over 1100 gallons of stormwater runoff. So again, a lot of water that has to go somewhere um, that we have to take care of. And this is kind of a fun site that you can actually um, calculate the amount of runoff that comes off your, your property or your roof. So again, you know, that water has to go somewhere and when there's too much of it, it can cause flooding, it can cause erosion, water is very powerful. Um, and then, you know, it can also carry pollutants and things like phosphorus um, into our waters and really stress our aquatic life and those things living in, living in the water. Um, and phosphorus is also um, one of the main causes of, of algal blooms. So it can make our water look pretty nasty. We're, we're pretty used to that here in Madison, unfortunately. So now let's talk about solutions. Um, we really want to help that water soak into the ground. We want to make this picture on the left act a little bit more like this picture on the right. And that's kind of where rain gardens come in. So the solution is to help that water soak into the ground. Um, you know, create more natural areas. Um, rain gardens are a huge help. Native plants, planting native plants, redirecting downspouts, um, you know, not going, having them go on hard surfaces, but rather having them, um, having them drain onto at least their lawn, if not gardens, and then rain barrels that, you know, harvesting water for use later. And so the rain gardens, native plants, um, um, there's just huge benefits to, to having rain gardens and, and using native plants in your rain gardens. Um, these native plants develop really, really deep root systems and that really helps the water to infiltrate um, and soak into the ground. They're well adapted to their environment, drought tolerant, disease resistant, and they develop these complex relationships with um, organisms and the ecosystem. Um, I really like this picture here. Um, you know, we're pretty used to our lawns are primarily Kentucky blue grass in this area. It's not native to this area. Um, and you can see just how short the root system is um, for Kentucky 
Kentucky bluegrass in comparison to something like buffalo grass, which is um, a native grass. It's not great for high traffic areas, so um, a lot of people don't use it, you know, as as lawn. Um, but it's just kind of showing how you know how big these roots are in comparison to Kentucky bluegrass, um, and then you know other native species that that really have these deep root systems and can really help that water to to soak into the ground and infiltrate. And there's just a bunch of other you know benefits to using native plants. Obviously, um, you know food and habitat for pollinators. These are just some some beautiful pictures, and there's Teresa in the, in the corner. <laughs> which obviously we, you know, pollinators are extremely important and, um, you know, whatever we can do to help protect them and provide habitat and food, I think is great too. So just an added benefit. And because native plants and rain gardens are so awesome, Dane Can County has this program called Plant Dane. Um, and I just want to give you a little bit of information about Plant Dane. I'll share more information later, um, but it's a program where you can get native plants for, um, a really reduced cost, about $2 a plant. And um, there's all sorts of other programs that we've kind of folded into it. You can donate to school and community projects. You can learn to grow your own plants from seed. And then um, what we're all here for today is um, you can learn how to build a rain garden. We always host a rain garden workshop every year. So again, I will share more information about planting later. I, I, bring this slide up with all these pictures because I you know if we want you to take away from this workshop that rain gardens can come in all shapes and sizes please don't think that you need a huge yard or you have to be an expert to build a rain garden you know when I started my position about five and a half years ago I had never really built a rain garden at all <laughs> I've learned a lot since then um, but I kind of if I can do it you can do it um, it you know it don't be intimidated by this. Um, we're going to make it as simple as possible. And, you know, um, you don't, they don't have to be huge. It can be small and mighty um, and it can be customized to take on a certain look. You know, maybe you don't like the tall prairie like feel. You can choose species that are shorter. Um, you can also get creative. You can put a border around your rain garden. Really the sky is the limit. And, you know, this, these pictures just kind of showcase that. Um, and this is Phil's building of his rain garden and it's infancy here you can tell that it's it's a pretty small rain garden um, and then there's also terrace rain gardens this is a picture from uh, Roger's rain garden at his home um, this is my rain garden in the front of my yard um, and then you can see this is a picture of, of a different rain garden but um, kind of really more well manicured has a border around it so um, you know there's all kinds of rain gardens so I just kind of want to leave you with, you can do this. Just, I promise you, you can do this. Um, again, you don't need a ton of space. You don't need a ton of expertise. Um, you're going to hear from Rick Eilertson, I think in the next class, but um, I always quote him during this workshop. Whatever you put in there is probably going to be better than what you have right now. So you can't really mess this up. I guess, you know, if you have really, really, really clay soils um, and, you know, they don't drain it all. Okay, maybe don't put a rain garden in there. But again, whatever you put in there is probably going to be better than what you have right now. So um, I just wanted to share this. Uh, this was a rain garden we built in. Um, Phil kind of took the lead on this one, but in an afternoon. So there was about six of us that helped out. And in an afternoon, um, we had everything set up. We didn't have the plants planted. It didn't look like this, but it was all set to have the kids actually help plant at LVM Elementary. So. Um, you can do this. Okay, I'll just leave you with that. And then here's my information, but you'll get that all um, later on too. Okay, next up is, whoops, is uh, Teresa Nelson. She is gonna talk a little bit about um, kind of a good locations for rain gardens and what you need to think about. Um, Teresa, can you access, do I have to give you control? No, I can share right here. Okay. And all right, I'm just going to get my screen situated. Um, okay. There, I want to make sure I had the chat up. 
so we can get that. All right. So yeah, thanks. Um, I am going to kind of start us off with um, how you figure out where uh, kind of in your yard or whatever property you're kind of thinking about, where you, um, where would be a good place for a rain garden. And so we have to remember that our main goal is to um, basically intercept water that's coming from those impervious spaces in our, in our property, um, coming off the roof, uh, coming off maybe a driveway or a sidewalk, um, because as Crystal said, when that runs off your property, it most of the time hits a street and streets are very dirty. And so that maybe clean water that's running off your property all of a sudden starts collecting a lot of pollutants as it runs uh, down that street. And so we wanna keep that water uh, more where it lands and um, get it into the ground so that we can uh, recharge our groundwater and not have that polluted runoff going into our storm sewers, which then go into our lakes and streams. So we're going to use, um, oh, and before I get into things, um, I just want to say, you know, you're going you're gonna to learn a lot tonight. Um, you might find that you don't have a good spot in your yard for a rain garden. And I don't want you to be disappointed about that because we want you to be successful. Um, we want you to, to, to put it in a place where, where it's going to do the most good. Um, so if you kind of find that, oh man, all the things you talked about tonight, I just, I just don't have a place where I can put it. So at the very least, you can always add native plants. It doesn't have to be in an area where you're, where you're capturing water for a rain garden. Uh, you can add native plants to your yard. Maybe you could add uh, a rain barrel or something like that to kind of manage some of the water. Um, but don't, don't be discouraged. Don't think it like, you know, I can't do this. I mean, there's still some things that you can do, but I wanted to put that out there at the front just so that you don't start getting like really concerned um, there you can do something so and like crystal said anything you do is going to be better than maybe what's there now so we're going to kind of zoom in to my yard and use that as an example for talking through the things that um, you'll want to consider when you're figuring out where to put a rain garden so site selection where, where to go. Um, some people might have uh, large yards, some people might have small yards. Um, wh where's going to be the best place to put this? What, what do we need to avoid? What do we need to consider? Um, let's, let's dig into that. So one of the first things that you want to look at really is just like how, how water is flowing um, from the surfaces in your yard and across your yard. So let's look at first downspouts. Where are the downspouts coming um, that are moving the water off your roof and across the, your, your yard? So uh, in, in my house, I've got four downspouts and the, the blue arrows kind of show where that water goes once it, it leaves the downspout. Um, then you also uh, want to look at your roof and what area of your roof is contributing to which downspouts. Some people might, it might be very even. Um, in my yard, actually, the one that's in the, the southwest corner gets an, a, a lot more roof, uh, contributes to that downspout than some of the other ones. And Crystal will show you some tools that you can use uh, to measure those areas so you can kind of figure that out yourself. One thing I want to talk about is is sump pumps. Some people have, you know, a sump pump. Um, a, a lot of people have sump pumps. Some of them run more often than others. Um, one of the things I want you to consider if you're thinking about directing sump pump water into a rain garden is that um, sump pumps are are pumping out water groundwater that's near your foundation. Um, if you are going to put in a rain garden and it's going to be fairly close to your foundation, you might just be kind of recirculating water out of your, you know, comes out of your sump pump, goes into your rain garden, basically travels back down to where your sump pump has to pump it out. So if you do have a lot of um, groundwater issues where your sump pump's running a long time, you're going to want to find a place that's well away from your foundation for a rain garden, um, if you can. 
So kind of taking a different view of things, um, and this is something you can do, maybe uh, those in Wisconsin, maybe not quite right now, since there's two feet of snow out there, but you know, go around and look at, look at the outside of your house. You know, where are your downspouts? Look at where they're, where they're going, how the water is moving across. Um, the downspout that I, I just showed you here, actually uh, when, it, when the house was built, they, um, they put a pipe underneath the sidewalk and then it kind of comes out right in the middle of the lawn. So that's where that one comes out. And then once it goes over the lawn, then it travels down the sidewalk in the street. The other one in the front kind of comes off the, the corner there and then pretty much leaves the property pretty quickly. So another thing to look at is the impervious surfaces. So besides your roof, what other uh, impervious surfaces are there? And um, sound like maybe somebody needed to, to mute there for a second. Um, sorry about that. Uh, so looking at my yard, we have a sidewalk. You know, where does that go? Driveway, there's uh, next to no opportunity to capture that the way it is. Uh, the back patio kind of goes down. So look at those other spaces in your yard and if there's opportunity to maybe intercept some of that runoff into uh, your rain garden. And then generally you just kind of want to look at how does water flow across your, across your landscape. Um, most of mine in the backyard, it kind of all comes to uh, the, the southwest corner and exits um, the, the corner of the property there. Uh, in the front, again, it's kind of um, going away from the house that way. Um, a really great way to figure this out is to go outside when it's raining and just take a look, see, see where water's going and kind of it'll help you understand um, where the, is the water moving to um, and where you might find some opportunities to kind of intercept it before it, it leaves your property. Um, again, looking at uh, the, the kind of the front view and the surface drainage in my front yard, it kind of tilts uh, away from the house and then also um, down the street. So, um, Another thing that you want to look at is what's in the way. So if you are trying to capture water from a downspout, say, um, what might be in the way of getting it from the downspout to where your rain garden might be? Um, in this one, my downspout, again, kind of goes off that direction. There is a tree um, there, so trying to move it kind of to the front yard is a little difficult. Um, the one that comes off the garage and goes underneath the, um, the sidewalk, some opportunity there, but you also need to consider what's underground. So in my case, I have a, my water service comes in, uh, my sanitary lateral is through the front yard, I have a gas service that comes through there. And so you always wanna remember that you need to, to check what's underground as well as what's above ground. So Diggers Hotline 811, um, they will come out for free and mark all of those. Um, so you can avoid putting it over uh, those things. Um, and so you're not inter interfering with any of those underground utilities. And another thing that I, I, I personally don't have a dog, but I know a lot of people who do and have electric fences. And it's really not fun when you dig through your electric fence. So um, make sure you know where that is. Uh, also for when you're trying to figure out where to put your rain garden, you don't want to dig through that. So other things to avoid. Okay, you want to be at least 10 feet away from your, your foundation. Um, you know, in general, you want to make sure that water is draining away from your house. And 10 feet makes it so that, again, you're not, you're not infiltrating that water right next to your foundation and, you know, maybe making your sump pump run more often than it needs to. And then also think about like how you use your yard. Um, my backyard, the, my kids do a lot of playing back there. And so I don't want to put a rain garden in the middle of the area that they're going to be running through all the time um, because they're just, they're going to run through the, the plants. So <clears throat> kind of avoid, avoid areas like that. Other things to avoid, um, if you have a well, you want to stay at least eight feet away, if not even more. Um, uh, that's pretty important. If you have a septic drain field, um, you want to stay at least five feet away from that. 
um, wet areas. So this is something that comes up pretty often and people I think, hey, I've got a wet, wet kind of, kind of uh, murky area in my backyard. This would be a great place for a rain garden. It might not be the best place. Um, you don't want to be, it's, it's already wet, so you don't necessarily want to um, send additional water to it because it's, it's already wet. It's already getting a lot of water and it's not draining. With rain gardens, we really want to um, give it an opportunity to soak into the ground in an area that's already wet doesn't, is, it's not doing that. So um, if you do have an area like this, it is a good place to plant some deep rooted native plants that can even maybe help dry it out a little bit, but you don't wanna direct any additional water to a wet area. Um, and you don't wanna sort of berm up or, or kind of make it stay there longer than it already is. And something that, people might not really be aware of unless you get like a really big rainstorm. But um, especially if you're in maybe a newer subdivision, they design subdivisions to move water basically in between pe people's houses. So a lot of times um, there's drainage easements through your backyard or your side yards. And that's where the water that's running off all the places in the, in the neighborhood is directed so that it can eventually leave. And um, so those areas tend to have a much larger drainage area um, or a contributing area than um, what you would be getting off of your rooftop or something like that. So, and you also don't wanna interfere with that drainage design. So you wanna make sure that you're not um, putting a rain garden in a place that's gonna get a lot of additional water or intercept kind of those uh, neighborhood drainage plans. Other things to avoid, um, retaining walls. You don't wanna put your rain garden sort of upstream of a retaining wall. Um, most of the time, in, unless it's specifically designed um, for the purpose, but most retaining walls can't handle that additional weight and pressure that that, that saturated soil would be putting on them. So you wanna be careful of that. And um, steep slopes. One, it's really hard. Your, your rain garden needs to be flat on the bottom. And so you can imagine trying to um, cut into a slope like this to make a flat um, surface. And you're gonna be moving a lot of dirt um, in order to do that. So generally you wanna um, keep it in not steep areas. And the one of the tools that Crystal is gonna show you um, has a layer. It's, it's fairly coarse and it's from 2017. So if, if any of your landscape has changed since then, it's not gonna be uh, very accurate for that. But it, it tells you the slope of the land. Each of those little squares indicates whether the slope is, if it's yellow, it's greater than 6%, but less than 12%. And then if it's orange or red, it's greater than 12%. Um, and basically anything that's orange or red, you would wanna avoid putting a rain garden. It's just gonna to be too, too steep um, and really difficult to do, to be digging a, a rain garden in that kind of area. So if you, um, you wanna take a look at this, it kind of gives you an idea of where um, maybe the steeper slopes on your property uh, are. If you want to measure that yourself, there, uh, it's explained in the rain garden manual how to do that. So other things to consider, um, you wanna look at where the sun is and kind of where you might get some shade. So where's north there? So the sun goes along the, the southern side of the property there. I've identified the trees that I have and um, thinking about, you know, some of them are really small now, but they hopefully will get big someday. Um, so think about, you know, the shade that they might provide. You can do rain gardens in the shade, um, but just so that you understand when you get to sort of the plant selection, whether it's gonna be a sunny or a shady site. Um, think about uh, where there's shade from adjacent buildings or houses, um, and that might be pretty deep shade. And finally, you can start thinking about, well, what do you wanna look at? You know, if you're, you're crystal, you wanna sit there and look at the, the hummingbird in your rain garden. So maybe you wanna put your rain garden someplace that you can look out a window and see it. Um, 
Maybe if you have some places where you might sit outside on your deck or your patio, maybe you put it someplace there so that you can kind of enjoy um, those native plants and the, the pollinators and other habitat that they bring um, uh, from those spaces. So if we kind of put all this together. So I, this, this looks a little crazy, um, but I did use our, our DCI map tool to do this. And you don't have to do it this way. You can easily print something out, out and you know, write on it. Um, you can use the tools in the, that mapping program to do this. You can measure your roof areas. But basically you wanna kind of look at all of these things and put it together and start saying, okay, knowing all of this, where might I put a rain garden? So in this case, the, the best place for a rain garden for me was the, the front yard. I'm able to capture the water that's coming from the downspout next to the garage um, that comes in basically outlets right into the middle of the, 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 the yard there. So that really was um, a, an ideal location to put a, a rain garden. Um, so the next things that we are going to talk about is, um, you know, how big it needs to be and how to construct it, and that's what we're going to be talking about in the next um, the next workshop. So um, just to give you guys a few kind of uh, glimpses into what the what my rain garden ended up being, I figured I'd share some pictures since I didn't get to show a lot of rain garden pictures in this this talk. So. I constructed this rain garden in 2016, and this was this picture was shortly after I planted the plants, so they're all pretty small. But some things to remember is that rain gardens can look interesting even in the winter. Um, this 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 year it's completely covered in snow. Like there's only a few things poking out. But this this was kind of a neat picture uh, a couple years ago. This is a picture from um, uh, what, like early in the spring. Um, and I'll mention that the, the, some of the, let's see, I think I can do a little laser pointer. Um, so the, the area that actually is taking water is kind of right through here, but I extended the garden even past that. So this part over here isn't, isn't getting any, um, any, you know, ponded water in it, it's just additional plants. So don't think like you only have to, only can put plants in the rain garden. It can be, you know, a low spot that you have plants and then you can plant other plants around it. So just to give you an idea of what that could look like. A uh, picture from kind of a summer picture, so some different plants blooming. And then a picture uh, from a fall, you know, one of the, the fall pictures. Um, some of the grasses turn a nice kind of red color, which is really kind of interesting. Um, I still have my laser pointer. This one is um, foxglove or penstemon, and it gets really red in the fall, which is really kind of neat. So with that, I think that kind of wraps up what I had for you for today. Um, so I don't know if we could, if we want to just keep moving on, Crystal, or um, if there were any questions. Well, I think we can, we are a little ahead of the game, which I was not expecting. <laughs> um, so if, if there are a couple questions, um, we could probably address them now. Casey, I know you've been kind of keeping track of the questions. If you want to unmute. Yeah, I love the engagement, everybody. Um, so one person asked, is there anything specific to consider with well and septic? Yeah, and so with, with well and septic, like I said, you want to, you, you don't want to be very close. One of the things with the wells is you just don't want, you don't want the water that's infiltrating from your rain garden to kind of um, be close enough that it would be getting down into your well. So um, the, the manual says eight feet at a minimum away from a well, um, but the, the DNR technical standard for rain gardens, which is sort of the, 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 the bigger standard on how you would design a rain garden, says if you're gonna be anywhere um, within 25 feet of a well, you should really check with um, your local permitting authority to, to make sure that there aren't any issues there. And with a the septic system, again, 
five feet is usually um, good enough to be away from your, your, um, your, your drain field. And just one follow up on the septic system. Um, just because the roots, you know, depending on, on what type of native plants you use, you may want to try to keep that even further away from, from a, a septic field just because um, you know, the root growth can, can end up uh, impeding some of the, the, the characteristics that you want for the septic field. Thanks, Rick. Uh, I have a question. So your rain garden looks beautiful. So I'm wondering if once I dig out the ground, will there be some help for designing? You know, because I, I don't know any plant well, <laughs> if this plant loves a sunny side or a shady side and, and stuff. So that will be great. Yeah, we'll be we'll be talking more about you know the the construction process and how you pick plants and and some of the plants that are are really good for for rain gardens in the next couple of classes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Casey. I don't think there were any other questions. I think it was just that subject. Well, question. I think that was it there. Yeah, we've had a few more come in oh, okay. um, now that it's open. So if you. <laughs> feel like we have time, I can list them off. Um, sure, I have. A, I think we have a few minutes. So if you want to start listing them off, I. Sure. Um, there is a question about, can I put a rain garden and a verge between the sidewalk and the road? I think that one's, a verge is the terrace. I, that's the new term to me. Um, but the answer is yes. Um, the city might have permitting for that, but if Teresa wants to elaborate on the siting for the terrace specifically. You can. Yeah, it, it does depend, you know, where where you are, and you probably should check with your, your local municipality um, as far as what the rules are. Some of them have rules as far as how high things can be on the terrace, um, and the, the City of Madison has a lot of really good information for doing terrace rain gardens on their website, and, and Phil's going to talk more about that this at, or later tonight as well. Another question is if you can combine a pond with a rain garden. Ooh, as far as having some open water and then having some water, some some edge that might um, get inundated when you get a rainstorm and then come back down. I, I would think that might be the way that you could do it. So the plants that you would plant around the edge of a pond. Um, would would kind of be your your typical bottom rain garden plants ones that that maybe even more so like it a little bit wet wetter than what you would normally even have in a in a rain garden you could think of more of like shoreline plants for that and then as you work up the slope from the pond you could have some of those more typical rain garden plants and and some of the, the more drier native plants further up There is a question about, um, do you need to avoid areas that get super saturated during rain events and have standing water for a day or two, or is that a good spot to have a rain garden? It's far away from any houses or buildings. Again, that might be a place where you just want to plant some native plants that like it a little bit wetter. Um, it already sounds like it's probably capturing a, that area is probably getting a lot of runoff already. And so um, planting some native plants with deeper roots might help that water soak in even a little bit faster than the one to two days. I have one more. Um, if the slope is away from the foundation, do you still need to be 10 feet away? Yeah, you still want to be 10 feet away because even if the slope is is going away from the foundation like it should, um, there's still some opportunity for that water to kind of um, get in and closer to your foundation. So just, just to be safe, you want to be at least 10 feet away. I think that was the last one, Casey. Okay, thanks for doing that. Okay, thank you, Teresa. You're You'll welcome. hear from Teresa again um, during the next class. Okay, so um, at this time we have just a, um, we're calling it a water break. Um, we have a poll question uh, we'd like you to answer just to get a sense for um, 
let's see, I will launch in a second. Um, just what type of site you might be considering for your rain garden. Um, you know, I, I'm guessing a lot of you are probably um, looking at your yard for your rain garden, but um, it's possible. I know we have some, um, some folks that are, um, that live within the green infrastructure study area or the, the pilot area for City of Madison. Um, and I know terrace rain gardens are an option there. Um, so we just are trying to get a sense for where you um, are considering putting your rain garden. Is it on you know public property, private property, um, your yard? Um, if you could just answer that, that would be awesome. And we'll just leave that up and we'll take a about five minute break. Um, come back at around seven um, if you want to go, you know, grab a glass of water or whatever, um, but we'll start up again at seven. Thank you. I think we're going to go ahead and get started again, just to make sure we have enough time for everything. Um, so next up is just, Teresa talked a little bit about um, site location and um, and also just, um, you know, what part of your roof, um, if you are going to build a rain garden and the drainage, if you're looking to kind of feed that rain garden, so to speak, um, from roof runoff. And that's, that's kind of the easiest way is, um, you know, kind of pointing a downspout um, towards your rain garden um, and, and collecting that roof runoff. Um, but um, trying to figure out you know, how much roof runoff do you actually have? And we're gonna need this information um, for the next class when we talk about sizing your rain garden. So um, Teresa talked a little bit about a couple tools that she used in her presentation to actually calculate um, your roof area. And I'm gonna share just a little demo of, um, of a couple of those tools so that you can use that um, as part of your assignment, we'll talk about the optional homework assignments um, after this class, um, trying to get prepared for the next class. So let me share my screen with you. I think I heard a little bit of feedback. So if you're not muted, if you can mute, um, that'd be great, but I think we're okay now. Okay. Okay. I'm hoping everybody can see my screen. It says DCI maps. Yes, I'm getting some nods. Okay, good. Um, again, sorry, my screen is on to the to the right of me, so I'm going to kind of look between screens. I'm not ignoring you. Um, so this is a tool that Dane County has. Um, it's called it's called DCI Map, um, and um, this is a way that we can um, you can get an aerial. Um, view of your of your property, look it up. Um, you can up, look up kind of the parcel lines, um, that's, that steep slope um, tool that Teresa talked about, where it kind of shades the sleep, steep slopes, excuse me. Um, you can access that from this tool as well. So I'm going to go through and um, kind of demo how you can calculate your roof area using uh, DCI map. And don't worry, we have a lot of this information written out um, you're going to get a link to a Google Drive with folder full of resources. Um, so don't feel like you have to write everything down. It's um, we we have a little tutorial um, in there as well. So um, again, this is the link, and again, the links are the links are in that um, in that uh, drive as well. So you don't have to you know feverishly um, write these down or copy these down. So you go into DCI Maps, and I'm going to put my address in here. Um, So what comes up is, um, you know, is your is your parcel. Um, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Okay, and then you're gonna go up to this um, little menu up on the top um, with these four. Um, it has four little boxes, and this is your base map gallery. So, um, if you remember, I um, I pulled up different aerial photographs from my neighborhood that had the two different ponds and the difference between um, you know, 1987 and 2020. Um, this is where you can get all that information. And it's not just aerial photography, but it's also you know street maps and topographic maps and so forth. But um, for us, we're going to use the um, 2020 imagery. So you'd click on here. And your home should pop up, hopefully, if everything goes well. Um, so this is my house, obviously an aerial view of my house. I click this off. And I'm going to zoom in as much as I can um, so I can, you know, 
see the roof pretty well. That's a little too far. This is probably as close as I want to get. Um, and I can still see kind of the, the property lines and everything. Um, there's a couple ways to do this. Um, you can use the drawing feature or you can use, so you have all these little icons on the top, or you can use this little ruler. I'm going to start off by using the ruler. Um, so you click on measure. And then I like to click on um, the polygon feature here. And then you can get all creative and you can pick a color. I'm going to pick I'm going to pick purple. And for me, um, I am going to zoom in just a little bit more so I can get closer here. Um, so the rain garden, uh, the area that I'm considering for my rain garden, I, I have one over here um, over on this area right now. The one that I showed you is, is kind of on the side of my house over here. Um, but I'm going to consider um, possibly using the downspout here to feed, feed a rain garden in this area. So what I'm going to do is I clicked on my, like, poly, on my little polygon feature. I clicked on a color. And I'm going to click. Oops. on the area, and I'm going to try to measure that area. So this is the whole, this is the area of the roof, and then I'm going to double click. Um, it's not perfect, um, but that's the area of the roof that feeds that downspout that's in the corner right there. So you just, again, you just kind of <laughs> you kind of outline that area and then double click, and it deter it calculates the area for you um, right there. And that's one way to measure uh, measure the area of your roof. It's not perfect. Um, again, it's, you know, it, it's very hard to get perfect here. I, I try to get a little. I try to go be conservative and be a little larger or go a little larger um, rather than smaller. Um, but also you. You also have to think that you know we're not taking into account the slope. There's a slope on this side and a slope on this side, so it's it's not perfect, but it it gives you a ballpark of that area, which is really all that we need to to size the rain garden. Um, so it's fairly easy. Um, and then what you can do is I I would calc I would I would write that um, that number down because sometimes when you print it out, um, it's hard to see that number um, when you print it out, and then. I'm going to go to, sorry, there's a print icon up here. And you can title your, your map whatever you want. I'm just going to say Campbell House. And you do want to keep the just the map um, feature there. Um, I've tried the other ones and it, it gets a little a little funky. Um, and then you can, you can you know, decide what type of format you want. Do you want a JPEG? Do you want a PDF? Um, I'm going to stick with a PDF. And then um, you press print. And it takes a while, but we'll get there. I hope. Okay. And then you can kind of take a look at at what that will look like. So that's, um, and you can kind of see how the number gets a little funky there. Um, sometimes it overlaps. So just writing that number down, the square footage um, is always a good idea. But you can then take this and you can actually just print from here. So that can be the, you know, the start of your site plan um, is just this aerial photograph and then calculate the measurement um, right there. Okay. Um, there's also another way to do it. You can also do it with um, the drawing feature. Um, and you kind of go about, the, go about it the same way. Um, I can choose polygon. I'll just go right over this. Oops. Oh, well, I used to be able to do this. Let's see. I wonder if because I have this on here, maybe I'll measure this instead. Oops. Well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna demo the drawing feature for you right now because <laughs> it's not working for me so well. Um, but at least you know one way to do it. So again, um, I used 
I use the, the little ruler here, the measurement feature. So that's one way to calculate your, um, your roof area. I'm also going to show you, um, I'm going to demo it using Google Maps because that's something that um, many people are familiar with. So let me pull that up right now. And again, I, I know I'm going to go in quickly here, um, but we have um, tutorials on both of these. So um, if you're not familiar with Google Maps, you know, just go to Google Maps, um, put in your address, and then um, click on the satellite um, view. And then you're going to zoom in. So as you can see, this, you know, this um, aerial photography was taken um, during the summer or the spring, and it's a lot harder to see <laughs> the landscape right now. Um, it's a little, you know, whatever, um, whenever it was taken um, in DCI map, um, that was taken, must have been taken in the winter because I, you know, there's no leaves on the trees and I can see my um, property much better. So that might be something you want to consider. Um, and it, this also, um, We've since put an addition on our house that went out this way. So this is not, you know, extremely up to date either. It must be at least at least four or five years old. Um, but anyways, so you, you know, you zoom into your property and then I just right clicked and select measure distance. And then I clicked on the corner of the area that I want to measure. Sometimes it gets a little funky here where you have to, again, kind of move it a little bit. And um, you can see on the bottom, once you kind of complete your, um, complete your shape, um, the total area um, pops up on the bottom here. So um, I think it was 325, I'm not sure what it was in DCI maps, um, but Again, it may vary, it's not perfect, but it's gonna give you a ballpark and that's gonna be good enough for, for sizing. But that's, um, you know, DCI Maps has a bunch of different features and I actually didn't bring that up. I should I should have mentioned that. Um, Teresa mentioned that in the layers, there's all kinds of layers, map layers. Um, so you can kind of play around with this. It's just a, a nice tool to have, um, you know, maybe not even for just the rain garden workshop, but um, you can put all kinds of different layers on here, um, you know, See, so the one layer that Teresa was talking about was the um, steep slopes, which is right here. Well, I may have to I may have to zoom out for steep slopes. I think we learned this last time, didn't we? It's just taking a while, I think. Or it might just not work for me now either. Let's see. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna start over here for you and just kind of. Let's try this one more time, just so I can show you the layers. Um, we'll get there, I promise you. All right. It's good practice to see it done a couple times, right? Right. <laughs> okay. 
All right, so there's our home again. And again, these are the, the different layers that are offered. Um, so you can kind of play around with it, but I really want to try to get that steep slopes layer up for you so you can kind of see that. There it is. I don't know what I did wrong, but there it goes. <laughs> so um, you can see on my property, I don't have any crazy steep slopes. Um, and there's really none in my in my neighborhood, but uh, it's kind of a nice tool to have. Um, so, or at least to pull up. All right. So that's DCI Maps, and then uh, and then again, Google Maps is a is a pretty easy way um, to, or a, an easy tool to use to measure um, your roof area too. Okay. Oops, I'm getting ahead of myself here. All right, that's all. I just wanted to demo those two those two tools for you. Um, up next is Emily Jorgensen, and she. So we're really trying to incorporate. Um, I, native plants, I think, can be overwhelming sometimes. I know in in the chat, I saw some of you say, "Oh, you know, I don't, I don't know much about plants." And are you going to talk about plants later? And so we're trying to incorporate um, some plants of the day or plants into each one of the workshops, and not wait until the end when we really talk about design and plant selection. Um, so Emily um, is going to Emily Jorgensen from the City of Madison is going to present a little bit of information on um, some plants you may want to use in your rain garden. Yeah, and later on, I'll also share some some really cool resources for people to kind of explore those native plants. Um, definitely not expected to remember everything that we talk about in this course. So. Um, okay, there you go. Can everybody see my screen? All right, let's start the plants of the day section. Um, so like Crystal said, we're going to have two of these little short sections for the first two classes. And in the last class, we're gonna go a lot more depth into plant selection. So our first plant of the day is Northern Blue Flag Iris. Um, it's a really good one for the rain garden basins. Um, it can tolerate up to two feet of standing water for up to four days. So it's gonna be really good at tolerating those kind of larger storm events. Um, it has a really gorgeous flower, quite complex, uh, doesn't get too, fall, too tall, about three feet, and it blooms from May through July. And you'll notice in the bottom right hand corner, there's a little traffic signal there. And um, those are just going to be some indicators that I put on my featured plants to show how well they perform usually in rain gardens. So when you see a green light plant, those are the rock star plants. They're hardy, they're tough, they're well behaved they tend to stay exactly where you put them in the rain garden. They have really worked out in the past for us. Yellow light plants are also gonna be really good natives, um, but just keep in mind that they may come with some extra challenges. So a yellow light plant may be a aggressive spreader, or it may be difficult to establish, or it may be short-lived. Um, so these are still really good plants and I like to include them. Um, it's just up to the gardener's choice how much time they wanna spend on maintenance and just have that in mind before they put the plant in the ground. And your red light plants are gonna be plant bullies. These are not gonna be, I hope, things that you plant in your rain garden. So these are gonna be invasive species, non-natives that are aggressive and are gonna take over your whole rain garden. So our iris here is a green light plant. It does really well in rain garden and gardens and it's really well behaved. A perfect example of a yellow light plant is one of my favorites, Joe Pie Weed. Um, this is a really awesome plant. It's an absolute magnet for pollinators. More often than not, you'll see a pollinator on it when you see it out in the field. Um, they prefer full to partial sun, medium to uh, wet soils, and they get pretty tall, like five feet. And the reason that this is a yellow light plant is because Joe Pie is also a pretty aggressive spreader. So normally Joe Pie kind of evolved with a lot more space to roam and move around and spread. And that wasn't a problem and it didn't really take away from plant diversity at that time. But when you translate that to a pretty small urban rain garden, it might not be the best mix. So if you wanna put Joe Pie weed in your rain garden, you could kind of consider this is gonna be aggressive, so I'm only gonna plant one or two of them or just a few. And I'm gonna be ready for the time when I see that it's spreading too far and more than I want it, so I can dig it up. So 
these are still good plants. Just note that there may be some extra maintenance. Here is a red light plant. And I put this one up here because many of you may know of it already, garlic mustard. Um, it's a really notorious spreader. It can seed like crazy and it actually alters the soil so that other plants can't grow in it, which is horrible. Um, and the reason I put this plant up here as well is to note that these red light plants, these invasive species and weeds, they might not look like invasives. They might not be those big burly bullies like burdock or bull thistle. They can be, you know, kind of attractive looking. And um, if you don't know what they are, they're just like a pleasant little flower that can easily go unnoticed. So always monitor your rain garden um, for plants that you didn't plant. Our next plant of the day is a really nice native short grass species called prairie drop seed. Um, if you like to have kind of a very well manicured um, looking garden, this is gonna be a good plant for you because you can see its growth structure is a very nice uh, tidy looking clump. Um, it has a really nice smell when the seeds ripen in the fall and it also has some really nice colors that come with it in the fall, those red colors. You also see in the bottom corner that I have a Plant Dane logo. So every time you see that with a plant, that means that is available this year, 2021 in the spring through Plant Dane. So if you like the look of it, you can order it through Plant Dane. And this presentation will also be available. So if you wanna go back and look through these photos and decide with that, you can go back. Um, so this is actually Teresa's rain garden. Um, you may recognize it from earlier. And that grass there is prairie drop seed. So. It's a really good one for the berm because it prefers those drier soils and she used it really nicely here just to kind of accentuate the edge of her rain garden. And with that, I'll see you next time and I'll send it back to Crystal. Thanks, Emily. Okay, so those, that's the end of our presentations um, for today. But uh, I do have um, some wrap up and let me grab my next slideshow here quickly. Okay. Okay, can you see it? Can everybody see it? Yes. Okay, good. Oops. Somehow I lost my screen over here, so one second. Okay. Um, so as I, I mentioned, we have a, a kind of a class assignment. After after each class, we'll have a, an optional class assignment. You obviously, I can't force you to do this, and you don't have to do it if you don't want to. Um, you know, they're they're pretty simple, and it's kind of just reviewing uh, what we went over during that class. Um, so the class assignment for today, um, for after this class, is to create a site plan. And we've kind of went through everything you need to create that site plan. Um, so this is my um, relatively primitive site plan. It, you know, it doesn't have all the bells and whistles that, <laughs> that Teresa's did. She did a really nice job using DCI maps and you can see I already had issues with DCI maps. So, um, but what you can do is you can, you know, at a minimum, you can use DCI maps or um, Google maps just to get an aerial photograph and print that out. Um, and then I, I used Google Maps for this one, as you can kind of see. Um, I use Google Maps to calculate um, the roof area um, to that downspout that I think may be feeding the rain garden that I want to put in in that area. Um, so just some things to, to include on your site map or your site plan, excuse me, are an aerial photograph of the property. Um, your downspout locations, if you are going to be um, using roof runoff to feed that rain garden, um, and then, you know, based on what you've learned today, um, you know, hopefully a rain garden works in your area or on your property. Um, you know, again, it may not, but you can always do something, put some native plants in there. There's always something you can do. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so 
just locate those uh, the downspouts, um, and then based on what we've learned, um, you know, put in where you think your proposed um, or a proposed location for your rain garden. So for me, uh, and you can't see my, I keep. I keep clicking along here, thinking you can see my um, my pointer, but you can't. So let's see here. Now we can, Crystal. Before we I couldn't, know. but okay. now I can. Do it. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> um, so based on um, again, I I'm looking at um, feeding my rain garden using this downspout. Um, I have an area here. Uh, this tree is no longer here, um, but there's some roots here that um, when that tree came down, um, it was a dead ash, but when it came down, um, there's a lot of roots in this area. So I was actually kind of trying to avoid that area for a rain garden because I know I would have to dig through a lot of those roots. So that's where my, that's why I put my, um, my nice red X right there because that's not something you would see otherwise. Um, so, but this seemed like the logical place for my rain garden. Um, there's not much here. Um, it's not too close um, to the to the sidewalk or to the property line. Um, and I have a nice downspout that can feed that rain garden right here. So, um, so including all these different components, the roof area and the, the areas to avoid that aren't obvious on the plan. Um, these would be good things to include in your site plan. And then, um, if you would like some feedback or you know want us to take a look at your site plan before the next class you are welcome to post that plan um, along with any questions you might have um, to padlet.com so this is the resource um, or tool we're kind of using um, to, to make this class interactive. I mentioned before that um, we usually hold this in person and we have time allotted, you know, almost an hour allotted in each rain garden workshop where you can really get kind of that one-on-one -on -one attention and people really appreciated that. And we were trying to figure out a way to build that in here. And that's how we kind of came up with the rain garden series um, format that, we, that we've that we used here. Um, plus we didn't want to keep you on Zoom for four hours. That's just cruel and awful. Um, so this is a way to try to get around that, but still kind of give you that feedback that everybody really appreciated last time. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to demo Padlet for you right now too. Uh, can you see Padlet right now or is it sharing? No, it's not. No, it's still. All right. I need to share a new screen. Just bear with me. How about now? Okay, good. So this is uh, the tool that we um, that we kind of agreed upon or fell upon. Um, it's really, really easy to use, and that's that's why we're using this tool um, as kind of a, a way to for you to submit I, your plans and then also to get questions answered. Um, following this workshop um, tomorrow, I will be sending out an email to all of you again with all these resources and links um, so that you have access to them. And you'll be invited um, to um, you'll be invited to this Padlet. Um, we've tested this out with um, some of our presenters, and some people just got an invitation right away. They could open it and access it right away without even creating an account. Others, for some reason, it asked them to create an account. Um, you know, put in a username and a password. Um, so I'm. I'm hoping most of you won't have to do that, um, but it is possible that you may have to create a username and a password to access this, um, and you'll get the link tomorrow. So the way we structured this is just, again, trying to keep it as simple as possible. Um, you know, class one site plans, um, just upload your site plan here, just like I did, and maybe put your name on it so we know who you are. And so you can just, it's fairly easy. You just click on that plus sign, um, and then, you can upload a document that way and you know create a title, whatever you want. I'm gonna delete this right now. Um, and then if you have any additional questions along with that site plan, you know, specific to your plan, um, you can add them in the comments section and that way we can try to respond um, to the, any of those questions. So in addition to that, so if you could just could submit your site plans, again, just to class one site plans, this column here, we'll just keep that specifically for site plans. Um, but if you have any questions after, you know, after this class is done, um, 
we started a column just for class one questions. So feel free to post them here and we'll be um, taking a look at them and trying to um, trying to answer them before before the second class there. Um, and then also, you know, we're just using this as a sharing tool as well. So if you have any great rain garden pictures or native plant pictures, um, feel free to post those here as well. Casey, are there any questions about Padlet that just came up? I've, I have so many screens open that I don't I can't even see the chat anymore. I feel you on that sometimes. Um, I did not see any questions come through okay. on the chat. So, and if you run into any problems, you can obviously email me. Okay, so that is Padlet. Let me go back to my other presentation. Uh, screen sharing, are you seeing my other, you're seeing my presentation again. Okay, good. Um, and I've talked a lot about this Google Drive. Um, we now we also have a Google Drive with a bunch of rain garden resources, and I just wanted to wanted to be able for you to take a look at um, at some of the resources that are in there. It's called the 2021 Virtual Rain Garden Workshop Resources Folder. You will get a link um, to that as well, so you can access everything in there. Um, there's a guide to common rain garden weeds. Um, DCI map instructions. This is a resource that um, another presenter from um, a couple years ago, he felt like he was not very tech savvy. Um, he said, oh, let me create this. I, you know, I'll, I'll do it step by step by step by step. So even the people that don't understand computers at all can figure this out. So um, that resource is there. Um, we also have our Plant Dane quick list. So these are all the species that are available um, through Plant Dane. Um, oops. And then we have um, our, well, had a feeling that might happen. Um, we have a class one assignment worksheet. So it lays out everything um, that you should include in that in that site plan and also a tutorial about um, Google Maps and how to use Google Maps to measure out that area. Um, and then, you know, those of you that, um, you should have all received a, a rain guard manual in the mail. Those of you that signed up a little later, yours might be coming a little bit later, um, but there's also a PDF version of that. And then um, site plan examples are in there as well. Um, in addition to a document with all the workshop links and our contact information so that you have that. Before we leave today, um, I wanted to just at least talk about this very quickly um, because I guess there's still maybe an opportunity where you could grow native plants from seed, but you'd have to get going on this really quickly. <laughs> um, so we have a native plant um, volunteer growers program where um, you can learn how to grow plants from seed. Uh, Teresa, you know, actually started that program with another one of uh, another one of the staff at Dane County land and water and uh, they created a, a guide so you know a tutorial there's a video that goes along with that and Dane County will supply you seeds and then these training resources um, so that you can start growing in the fall um, using milk jugs and um, it allows the seeds to overwinter and then you know they're ready by the following summer um, and the way it works is that the grower, um, if we provide you with seeds, the grower can um, can keep some of the plants, but then um, we also ask that they donate some of the plants that they actually um, that they actually grow um, to our free native plants and for school and community projects. Um, obviously, you, you know, you can use all our resources um, and learn how to grow your own native plants that way. Um, we just wouldn't be able to provide you seeds um, if you weren't part of the volunteer grower program. Where we supply the supply the plants to um, our projects. So that's just a picture of um, one of the elementary schools that was a recipient of um, of our grant program, where they received native plants, which is pretty cool. Um, and you need about sixty days, right, of overwintering, Teresa, <laughs> to is uh, that some correct? of them. Okay, you can get away with shorter with some okay. of the species, okay. and some don't even need any time outside. So there's still a chance that you could you could start this now if you're interested. And again, I'll, I have the link on the Google Google Drive. So just a teaser for class two. I hope you'll all you know. Hopefully we didn't scare you off or anything like that um, during class one. And you're you're gonna come and or hoping to come to class two. Um, 
these are the things that we're going to cover in class two. So sizing, uh, construction, and then just design considerations. Um, and questions, again, post them on Padlet or um, if you really would prefer to do it via email and you don't want to post it, you know, for everybody to see. Um, I have an email address specific um, for this workshop. It's info at ripple-effects.com. If you could email them to that email address, um, that would be great. Um, just so I can kind of sift through them. And then, you know, if I don't have the answer, I'll reach out to our presenters and, and get the answer for you. Okay. That is all I have. So I thank all of you for, for coming. Um, I really appreciate it. Do we have any last minute questions, um, Casey, in the chat that came up or? No? Okay, I know we're about five minutes over already, which if you know me, that, that's pretty good actually, five minutes only. Um, so and thanks for coming everybody. Um, we really appreciate it. I hope you got a lot out of this workshop um, and that you're energized and you know ready to go. Um, for those of you that are staying on with us, um, Phil Gabler, I feel like I'm a flight attendant. Those of you that are staying on to like the next leg of the, the trip, um, Phil Gabler is going to be talking about um, about the City of Madison Green Infrastructure Reimbursement Program. So that is specific to um, the City of Madison Green Infrastructure Area, which is on the near west side of Madison. Um, if you are located in that area, you probably should have received an email from Casey um, letting you know about that. So um, anybody and everybody is welcome um, to, you know, to stay on and listen to Phil's presentation, but it is very much geared at that area. Unfortunately, the rest of us don't yet have a reimbursement program, but if the City of Madison reimbursement program goes well, um, who knows, maybe we'll go count countywide later on. Um, so this is Phil. I'm going to hand it over to you. And, and if you're uh, you're feeling a little burned out, I promise you'll be very quick and <laughs> there's a chance you'll get money, right? So there's a nice incentive to stay. <laughs> if you're in the study uh, area. <laughs> if you're in the study area. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, so I need to stop sharing or can you uh, I'll stop sharing? This will work. Huh? This is showing the wrong screen. Now I think we are there, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So the study area is located, right? Just so we all know we're in the right spot, the stud in the, the Winger watershed. And it's this little black line here. This is the Glenway golf course. This is uh, Midvale, Mineral Point, and Odana Road, kind of are the main blocks. And here's our zoomed in map. You'll see these red uh, lines here. Those are the street that was reconstructed last year, which you may have noticed uh, a lot of equipment in your neighborhood. So this is the Roger Bannerman Rain Garden Initiative. We uh, named this uh, for after Roger because of all the work he did in rain gardens and that this is kind of a program that really gets at what Roger would like to see, which is a rain garden at everybody's house, or three or four, you know, depending on how much room you have. Um, kind of three flavors here. Uh, there's a thousand dollars available per house. Right. With that, now this is my favorite. I fought hard for this one. Uh, this is the 110% rebate if you do it yourself, right? Your time and your effort is worth something this is a way to include that in the process, right? So you spend $900, you get $999 back, get a nice dinner or a few extra plants. Uh, things that are included in here, right? Your workshop, where you're at right now, hand tools. I'm not gonna buy you a rototiller, but I can get buy you a shovel. Uh, if you wanna rent the rototiller, you can include that in the fees, but it'll be a rental cost. Soil amendments, so sand and compost, and then plants. And these are plants either through Plant Dane, which you can buy a lot of plants through Plant Dane for $1,000. Or you can buy plants that you want from anywhere. Just keep your receipts and submit them. You can get your money back. Plus 10% if you do it yourself. Uh, if you hire a contractor, which we've had people do, right? Hit the easy button. You went through this class, you know what you want, but you don't want to do the work. You can hire a contractor and you can still get up to $1,000 back. But in order to get $1,000, you have to spend 
a little extra, right? We're gonna give you 80% back of what you spent. And then there's a third option, uh, which is that we will come and pick up your extra dirt, right? Our operations crews will drop off a one cubic yard Kevlar bag. You put that in your terrace, you wheelbarrow your soil out and fill it up on the terrace. Don't try to move it after you fill it because soil weighs 125 pounds per cubic foot. And there's 27 cubic feet in there and none of us are that strong. So fill it up on the terrace and that will give you, you for that service, uh, we're gonna take a little bit off and you'll have to, you get 90% back of what you spend, but you can still get up to a thousand dollars. I've been asked the question many times, well, what constitutes a contractor? Can I pay my buddy's kid 20 bucks an hour to dig the hole for me? And well, does that put me in the 80% or the 100, 110%? My take on this is that if you declare the expense of labor of somebody else, then it's a contractor. You do it under the table, fine by me. I don't need to know about it. Hope we're all clear. We're recording so, this, you know, Phil, right? Yes. <laughs> under the table makes it sound so shady, but it's not. It's, it's just that if you, you can make the decision, if you decide that you want to use the labor expense towards your $1,000, go ahead and do it. It just means you get an 80% uh, rebate. So your garden should be over $1,200 if you're going to do that, just so, just so we all know. Uh, the reimbursement process, right? We've also had the question, well, I don't have 600 square feet of roof that goes to a rain garden, because that's kind of the threshold where you get $1,000. Let's say you only have 475. We'll just prorate that. And so 475 is 79% of 600. And that means you'll get $790 as your eligible rebate. But that's just for that project, right? You can then spend some money towards a rain barrel. If you get 150 square feet of roof to a rain barrel or a second garden, we can mix and match. Our goal is to get as much green infrastructure on your property as possible and to treat as much roof as possible. So, What's the process? This is basically, this slide will be up on the website. You can read through this. We, as you start out, right? Email Richie Breidenbach or myself. We'll confirm you're in the study area. Put together your plan. You are doing this right now, being in the workshop. Uh, we can give you kind of pre-approval and help you know what your budget would be based on a rebate. We, uh, we have just an agreement now. There was a deed restriction, but we've changed that up. Uh, if you're using the contractor and get quotes, if you're doing it yourself, Estimate your expenses. When you're done, take a few photos, send us your receipts, and ask for your reimbursement, and then we will send you a check. It's pretty simple, you know, a lot of steps, but uh, we will go, uh, we'll walk you through this after you kind of uh, reach out to us and say that you're interested. And as I said, no deed restriction, right? Originally, uh, people, some people felt we needed to have a deed restriction so that the rain gardens that went in stayed for at least five years. In hearing feedback from people and being in the time of COVID and looking at the expense of the engineering department filing a deed restriction, we think that most people want the rain garden or you wouldn't go through the effort. We're just going to have you basically sign an agreement that says, I understand that you'd like me to keep my rain garden for five years, and that saves our basically engineering program, $30 to not file the deed restriction. Because the whole intent was to notify the next person that would live in your house if you moved in that window. So five year agreement, no notary, no witness. And we're gonna use the savings to buy a small little sign that we'll give you that you can choose to put in your rain garden if you want that says this rain garden was funded as part of the Roger Bannerman rain garden initiative. And it was in, established on this date. And that's it, just a notification. People know that it's a rain garden if you happen to move. And that way people will see what it is and maybe ask a question, they know where to look. With that, I have uh, people that are working with us here that know about the program, uh, a link to the website, and you can sign up to get more information as it comes out. Um, but you're here, so you've gotten the, a lot of the information you need. So if you're going through this and you live in the pilot study area, please uh, reach out to us and we'll try to help fund your rain garden. I think I see a few chats. I couldn't see those as I was going. 
I'm not sure why. I think I'm... I'm looking at the chat right now, Phil. I didn't see. Besides, Rick wants to know if there's any homes for sale in the area so he can take advantage of the program. <laughs> Um, well, we did have a we had a question about a list of recommended contractors. Oh, I'm I'm still looking up. Uh, and uh, we do not have that as of now. Um, I think I would and look, I would look for someone who knows native plants as far as finding a, a good contractor in the area. Um, and I'm hoping as we get more in. Uh, I know the people that have used contractors so far have had a good experience. I feel I'm a little bit, I, uh, I can't recommend a, a contractor to give preferential treatment, but I am hoping that I will be able to share the names of the people who have put in the rain gardens, and then they can tell you their experience with their contractor. I also wanna add that, I know there's like three existing rain gardens, maybe a little bit more in the Westmoreland area. So if you are on the Westmoreland Neighborhood Association listserv, you might also be able to send out an email to just like a general email and see if people have recommendations. But it's a little bit, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, Westmoreland uh, emails and I don't want to make it, you know, how do I say? <laughs> So I'm just wondering if you can add the names or just share it email privately if, it, if you don't like it public. Because I'm not familiar with anybody and I don't have a lot of friends in this area. And, but I really want to know somebody who have done um, rain garden contractors so that I can work with that person or that company. I'll, I'll reach out to two of the, the people who have submitted, submitted for rebates, rebates and ask them if they were, were willing to contact you. If that's okay, if I share your email address. Yes, yes please. Okay, I'll, okay, I'll do I'll that do this that week. week. Okay, thank you. I think that was the only question. Unless right. you saw something else, Casey. Well, thanks everyone for hanging on for an extra, I guess, 15 minutes here. Talked longer than I wanted to, but this happens. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you all very much for, uh, and Crystal, thank you for letting me have a few minutes here to talk about the reimbursement program. And I hope to see all of you next time. Thanks again, everybody.